Recently, I was reflecting on my first years as a public school administrator. I recall one of my first objectives was to review, revise, and refine the emergency management plan. At that time, I had never heard of a needs assessment, much less a vulnerability assessment. However, as the son of a father who was a firefighter and a mother who served as police dispatch, I relied on my naive instincts to move into this task. My first school was located in a very low socioeconomic neighborhood riddled with crime, gang violence, and poverty. Each day was a struggle to simply maintain a negotiated truce on campus among the three rival gangs that were part of the community. The roar of the high-pressure washer each morning on campus was a familiar sound of mitigation to remove the previous night's graffiti before students began to arrive on campus. That's how most days at my school started. The school was built in 1963, the same year I was born. I often wondered what that first class of school children were like. There was an old gold frame picture of Dr. Richard Carr, the first principal of the school, hanging in the front office. I'm sure we both held safety as our shared priority, but I'm not certain that gangs were part of the community 50 years ago. When I arrived at the school in 1991, there was still evidence of 1963 technologies throughout the building, such as the old fire alarm pool stations on the outside of every building. Eight solid red brick buildings, two fire alarm pull stations mounted on the outside of each for a total of 16 pull stations. Each one armed and operational, none of which had a locking protective cover. As a result, our staff and students became very efficient at our fire evacuation protocol. Safety records would reflect that we did indeed execute our state mandated fire drill once a month. Discipline records would also verify that we averaged an additional three false alarms per month due to the unrestricted access to the pull stations. Early on as a staff, we agreed to treat each sounding of the alarm as an opportunity to practice our evacuation procedures. And of course, after a safe evacuation, full student accountability, and an efficient return to class, I was left to investigate the matter and identify the culprit. From school administrator to fire prevention specialist to crime investigator, all with one tug in an unsecured 1963 pull station. And of course, managing those 16 fire alarm pull stations was the high-tech interface of the Fire Source Master Board. The fire source master board was a control panel located behind the front counter in the main office, above the emergency radio, and adjacent to the school's PA system microphone stand. Now this technology was a piece of work. Red lights, amber lights, green lights, toggle switches, yellowed masking tape with indistinguishable numbers scrolled on them, and in thick black magic marker the words do not touch emblazoned on the rusty metal cover. And finally, a single mystery key lodged forever in a keyhole without a name. Recently, I was invited as an alumnus staff member to return to that school as district officials intended to host a ribbon cutting ceremony to acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the school. Staff, students, and parents, and I'm sure a very worried principal, were all anxious to show off this $14 million bond approved building uh, that they have just completed as part of the 50 year celebration. Although I was not able to attend this nostalgic event, I suspect the buildings will have all been modernized with accoutrements and amenities of current day construction. And I'm certain that each building will be outfitted with the latest in fire prevention technology to serve and protect today's students. And I have a strong suspicion that somehow the fire source master board will have been preserved behind high grade plexiglass as some historical artifact to commemorate a long forgotten fire technology. Perhaps someone has unlocked the secret behind the dangling key in a keyhole without a name. I have since become aware over the years of how new schools are built. They are architectural and construction principles known as SEPTED or crime prevention through environmental design that help guide new construction. The principles at work here are intended to maximize the use of space in a manner to enhance safety and security. SEPTED principles typically include increased attention to occupant security, increased use of day lighting and comfort control, matters of construction durability, uh, flexibility, and also design for eco-friendly sustainability. Practical measures like attention to ingress and egress, lines of sight, visibility, pedestrian motor traffic are all examples of SEPTED principles. In those principles, typically visitors are greeted by a live person uh, who invites the guests to sign their name, the time of day, and perhaps present some form of identification. Typically, the visitor is asked to don a visitor identifier, such as a visitor badge or lanyard. This identifier provides clear visual evidence that the person has been cleared to be on campus. Mindful construction also supports other measures of safety and security. 
Consider, if you will, a school that has a clear perimeter outlined by fencing or some other physical border. This kind of barrier supports the notions of keeping students in and others out. So whether it's an attractive fence which enhances the aesthetic appeal of the property or a rusty chain link fence with ominous barbed wire, it serves a purpose. A safe campus can also take many forms, including the use of staff to help manage matters of safety and security. In fact, an informed staff may well be the greatest asset to the safety of students on campus. Frequently scheduled staff development and or training in the area of safety and emergency management is the best way to ensure effective response to a multitude of potentially dangerous situations. Organizations who invest time in training staff members to respond to emergency situations benefit greatly from the experience. In the absence of training, staff may respond in ways that is not conducive to saving life and property. Frequent and effective staff development and training allow adults to become effective responders. Training matters. In fact, research suggests that those who receive training view themselves as responders to the event as opposed to victims of it. This allows members of the impacted organization to recover from the emotional and psychological impact of the event. This post-event disposition is the factor that allows individuals to recover faster with healthier results. So we have learned much since 1963 regarding operations far beyond reading and writing. New school construction takes into consideration a variety of safety measures. We've learned that an informed and skilled staff can provide perhaps the greatest measure of safety and security. And finally, we've learned that training matters and we have a responsibility to provide those critical learning opportunities for personnel. In the big picture, school environments are intended to create the conditions for learning. The physical building and the adults who inhabit the space are responsible for creating the culture and climate that provides safety and enrichment for children. It is in this space that wonderment should thrive.